All right, that's my cue. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we were just talking generally about uh, about Rwanda and trekking and um, and of course about the, the gorillas. Um, and we asked for people to put in the chat where you're joining us from. So welcome to our Together Women Rises March web, or this is April, well, I'm back to the April webinar. I am Vicki Bush Joseph. I'm a member of Rises Board of Directors, and I will be the moderator for tonight's event. Before we get started, I'm sure we all know this, but just a few Zoom reminders. Please keep yourself on mute while our um, speakers are presenting. There will be a Q&A after um, uh, Dr. Stwinski, um speaks, and you can enter your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. The closed captioning feature has been enabled. You can go to your Zoom toolbar and click on show captions. April is volunteer National Volunteer Appreciation Month, and we would like to take a moment to recognize the more than 500 exceptional volunteers across the country whose time, talents, and treasures make what we do possible. Volunteers are integral to almost every aspect of RISE's work from leading our local chapters and screening our grant applications to supporting our chapters and managing our book club and our advocacy group. We could not make the global impact we have made over the past 20 years without you. So thank you very much. Now, turning to our speaker of the night who is here representing our April featured grantee. Each month, Together Women Rise features a project that addresses one of the many challenges faced by women and girls in low-income countries in the global South. Rise firmly believes that gender equality and climate justice must go hand in hand if we are to ensure we have a clean, healthy, and sustainable planet for future generations. April also happens to be Earth Month, and in recognition, we are highlighting the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, a champion of conservation efforts in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. First, we're going to play a short video about the organization, and then we'll have our conversation with our guest speaker, Dr. Tara Stowinski. Girls in Conservation program matters because from the work that the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund has been doing, we have observed that girls who finish their secondary school education, the number is very low and that correlates to what has been reported by the latest Rwanda Demographic and Health Survey, where only about 9% of women in the northern part of Rwanda, where the Fossi Fund works, have attained their secondary school education or higher. This results in poor or lack of education, which in the long run contribute to gender inequality, lack of sustainable income, and in our area, the Volcano National Park, dependency on the park resources, which threatens the habitat and the survival of endangered species like mountain gorillas and golden monkeys. One of the reasons that we started this program is because we were seeing a lot of inequities uh, across our educational programming in Rwanda, as well as the statistics collected by the Rwandan government that show less girls uh, graduate from secondary school than boys and therefore have um, less paid opportunities post-secondary school. The community we walk in usually ends their education at primary school because they cannot afford to go for good education in boarding schools. Girls in Conservation is our new program that aims to address gender 
inequities uh, in schools around Volcanoes National Park um, to help girls reach educational attainment. That's graduating from high school or secondary school, as it's called here, uh, and also to help um, further their interests in paid opportunities post-secondary school, primarily in the fields of conservation or green jobs. With the Girls in Conservation program that started in 2023, our aim is to equip them with life skills and pro-conservation mindset through our lessons that range from biodiversity and ecosystem services to green life skills and careers in conservation. The second aim is to connect girls with professional females for guidance. And the third aim is to contribute to the increase in the number of girls in the Volcano National Park area who attain their secondary school education. Education and community are part of the FOSI Fund pillars that aim to helping people saving gorillas. The FOSI Fund is a non-government organization that's science-focused, dedicated to the protection and scientific research of mountain gorillas uh, here in Rwanda and also the Grower's Gorillas in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the organization stands on four holistic pillars. Protection, we have teams in the field 24-7 protecting the gorillas, uh, conducting critical science needed for conservation activities, strengthening capacity of local conservationists as well as helping communities. Quantum, quantum Conservation is in Tambri Maria, the movement, but to Mamena Kuvigra Muruhami, Kuvan is their confidence. A cousin Nubana Zakora, Nukuza Munarimu, Nijisha Vajenzi Vange, Nijisha Vaturani, Besson in Jerizose, Uriachit Kwabunga won't give it to Chichija, the Senava Shikumania, Kuanjanari Swamisiwaho. Just a group of young men, you know, could reach each other. It's unbelievable. No, we should go. We come here. Can't even show you. Can't do. We come here. Nanja, how did you know? Kora, we didn't see you. Mama, we are Kora. We do reach each other. Nanja, now we should come here. Inda, we could have not forced. Now we are going. We are going to go. Money, money, I can't see. Money, time, no money. Now we are going. Now we are going. We are going to go. 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 Ariko aho girls in the conservation is tangiri chani chani kuri chichiko cha achu. Tukwa wa njimi hindu kakuwa na wabako oga, bari tabira, bari wope ni chani kubitanya na masomo. Mesiba fitisha kariyoku menya, modilu saange, tulashimira girls in the conservation. Thank you to Gather Women Rise for supporting girls in conservation. This help us reach our overall goal of helping people saving gorillas. Murakoze together women rise. Murakoze together women rise. Murakoze together women rise. Murakoze together women rise. Thank you, Together Women Rise. So fun to see <laughs> the, what a what a great video and um, so wonderful to hear directly from so many of the young women themselves. Um, so we are pleased to have with us Dr. Tara Stowinski, President, CEO, and Chief Scientific Officer of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. Dr. Stowinski is a primatologist and global leader in the study and conservation of gorillas. During her 20 plus years at the Fossey Fund, she has led dramatic increases across the organization's key pillars, which they talked about in the video, protecting gorillas, conducting science, training conservationists, and building re resiliency in park adjacent communities. And she now leads a team of nearly 400 working to save gorillas and their critical habitats in Rwanda and the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. Committed to equipping the conservation leaders of today and tomorrow with the skills to succeed, 
Dr. Stuinski led the development of the Ellen DeGeneres Campus, an award-winning research and educational facility in Rwanda that provides hands-on training opportunities to hundreds of early career scientists each year. Her work has been featured in numerous press outlets, including NPR, 60 Minutes, watch that segment, it's so much fun, National Geographic and CNN, highlighting the significance of gorilla conservation for global biodiversity and the health of the planet. Welcome, Dr. Stuinski. So to start, um, I think a lot of us are familiar with Diane Fossey and, and with the Gorilla Fund. Um, maybe some of us have read Gorilla in the Mist. Some of us have seen the, the movie with Sojourney Weaver. Um, but I suspect that some of our younger members might not really know um, the backstory or the foundation story. So could you tell us a little bit about the history of the organization and the legacy of its founder, Diane Fossey? Thanks, Vicki. I'd be happy to. Um, and I just want to echo what you saw so many of um, our supportees and colleagues in Rwanda say and say more cozy, which is thank you in Kenya, Rwanda. I really want to thank Together Women Rise. There's nothing I can think that I'd rather be doing on a Thursday night than spending time with a lot of women who care about empowering other women, particularly women in the global south. So thank you so much for your support. And it's a real honor for me to be here and talk about an organization that I have dedicated more than two decades of my life to and just think is phenomenal. Um, and I always say that my career was made possible because of Diane Fossey. For those of you that may not be familiar with Diane's story, she was an animal lover from a child. She wanted to be a vet, but I think organic chemistry uh, was not her friend. And she ended up instead going on and being an occupational therapist where she worked with children. And I think she credits that with giving her some of the skills that she needed to eventually study um, animals. When she was in her mid thirties, she quit her job, um, got her appendix out, supposedly broke up with her fiance and moved halfway around the world with no formal scientific training to study the then relatively unknown mountain gorillas. And at that time, you know, the image of mountain gorillas of gorillas in general were these ferocious King, Co King Kong style beasts. So she went and she lived high up in the Virunga volcanoes in Rwanda at about 10,000 feet. It is um, not what a lot of people think of of Africa. It is a montane forest. It's inhospitable. It is cold. It is wet. It rains, you know, nine to 10 months out of the year. Um, very, very remote. But she lived there for 18 years um, studying and protecting these amazing animals. Uh, her original work was to learn about them, to learn about their behavior. Um, and that was made very famous through her being featured in the National Geographic and on the cover, the book that she wrote and the eventual movie that was made about her life. But soon after she got there, she realized that she couldn't just be studying these animals, that she had to be protecting them. And that's because at the time they were being pretty heavily poached. People thought it would be cool to have a gorilla head on their mantle or a gorilla hand as an ashtray. Um, the forest was being encroached by people that were using it to graze their cattle. And so she went quickly and expanded her original work from doing science to act, doing what she called active conservation. So hiring people to come in the forest and remove snares that could capture the gorillas and other wildlife um, to chase cattle herders out of the farm. I mean, out sorry, out of the forest. Uh, she made a lot of enemies in the process, and in 1985, she was actually murdered in her cabin high up at, at her research center, which is called Karasoki. So if you hear me refer to Karasoki, that's what I'm, I'm talking about, is her the research center she started. Um, but luckily, the organization did not die when she did. It was kept going by a bunch of volunteers and board members, which we heard Vicki mention how important volunteers are. And now 57 years after she started the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, it is the world's largest running and, and um, longest running, sorry, and largest organization that's fully dedicated to gorilla conservation. So we're very proud of that fact. And as a result of the work that she started and that's been continued by our organization, the governments were in the countries where gorilla, mountain gorillas are found, the other NGOs that are working for conservation, Mountain gorillas are actually the only great ape on the planet other than ourselves, because we are a great ape that are increasing in number. All the other, you know, th there's a lot of doom and gloom about conservation, but mountain gorillas are a very rare conservation success story. So we're incredibly proud of that fact. 
Um, there's only a thousand of them left, so they are a very conservation dependent species, but at least they're moving in the right direction. That is quite a legacy. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, I, I did want to uh, ask you, um, it, including your own, like you said, she kind of set the trail, uh, blazed the trail for you. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I noticed that you were a history major undergrad, also considering veterinary medicine. <laughs> um, and, but do you mind telling us how you ended up in, in being a primatologist and working at the, uh, the fund for the past 20 years? Yeah, no, I'd love to. Um, yeah, I also was a a person that loved animals from from my childhood. I had parents that loved animals and we had quail and chicken and um, dogs and cats. Even though I, we didn't live in the country, I lived in suburban Philadelphia. I saw that there are some people here from Philly, um, but really loved animals, was planning to go to vet school, was actually accepted to vet school, but had had the opportunity when I was an undergraduate to study abroad in the UK. And I decided that I wanted to go do that again. So I went and spent a year at the University of Oxford, I got a master's in biology, and I had the opportunity when I finished to go to Zimbabwe as a intern, as a research assistant, and study jackals, which are, you know, small, they're in the dog family. Um, I never saw them. They are completely nocturnal in the area where we worked, in particular, because they were viewed as pests by humans, so they were often hunted. Um, they wore special collars that emitted a radio frequency, so we had a an antenna and we would just kind of follow them around at night. We started at six at night and we ended at six in the morning. It was freezing cold. I had no idea how cold Sub-Saharan Africa can be in their, their winter, um, but I absolutely loved it. And so when I, when I came back to the States, I decided to pursue a PhD in animal behavior instead of going to vet school. And was just very lucky that I was living in Atlanta and there was a great program here where you could get a PhD at, at Georgia Tech and do your research at Zoo Atlanta. And the Fosse Fund has been based at Zoo Atlanta for 25 years. And so I kind of naturally moved into this, this niche. And I've been studying gorillas for 30 years this year, actually. I started studying them in 1994, worked with captive gorillas for about eight years before then going into the into the field. So in, in some ways it was this love of animals and then eventually a love of, of getting to work in Africa. But um, gorillas were not necessarily where I thought I would end up. And that was really luck in a lot of ways. Um, and I feel incredibly lucky that I that I did end up there. Very cool. Thank you. Um, I so admire people like you and Diane Fossey um, and others who can who, who can do what you do. And uh, uh, we were talking about how difficult the trekking itself is. I can't imagine being out there for days on end um, and all hours of the day and night. So uh, thank you to the scientists. Um, so coming back to uh, the Fosse Fund mm -hmm. today, um, in the in the uh, video, you mentioned the the core mission, the objectives, the pillars. Um, but you could could you share a little bit more about that? I noticed your motto is helping people saving gorillas how does how does that and i and it's helping people comes first and then saving mm -hmm. gorillas how does that work yeah well we know ultimately that for gorillas to thrive that the people that live near them must thrive at what as well particularly in in the areas where we work you know working in rwanda and eastern congo rwanda is i believe the most densely populated country in africa there's, you know, probably over 350,000 people living right on the edge of the park. So literally, for those of you that have gone gorilla trekking, you know, you are walking through someone's farm and suddenly the farms end and the park begins. There's no buffer zone. So people are going into the park for critical resources. Gorillas are coming out. And so ultimately, and a lot of these people are quite poor. Um, and so they are dependent on park resources for water, for firewood, for food. And so ultimately, if we want to be successful um, for in gorilla conservation, we need to be helping and working with people. Um, and we take a very participatory approach. So it's not us going in and telling communities, well, we, this is what we think you need, but it's sitting and listening to them um, and hearing what they need and then trying to help figure out how we can implement them that alongside and with them. 
And I think in, in Eastern Congo, where we work, it's even more extreme. Eastern Congo has the second highest rate of extreme poverty on the planet. Um, about 78% of people are existing on less than $1.90 a day. Um, and these people in the areas where we work, there, there is no domestic protein. They really exist on cassava, kind of one food plant. So for them to eat meat, they have to go into the forests and hunt. So again, it's critical if we want conservation to work that people are part of the equation, but also it's just, it's the right thing to do in the areas of the world where we work. We can't just be there protecting animals when you see that people really need um, assistance as well. And what I find so inspiring is that despite these really challenging conditions, and again, to bring up Eastern Congo, where there's been extreme civil unrest for the last two plus decades, over 5 million people have died, incredible displacement within Eastern Congo. The fact that people still care about conservation and still wanna do it to me is amazingly inspiring. I mentioned how mountain gor gorillas are increasing and that's a rare conservation success story. That's very inspiring. In Eastern Congo, where the situation is not nearly as rosy, and we've actually lost over 60% of the types of gorillas that live there in just the last two decades. So we've got a long road to go for conservation. But the fact that people want to do conservation and, and they just they they need people to help them is very inspiring and, and one of the things that keeps me going on a day-to-day -day basis. Um that is that is one one thing I want to get to a little bit later is what what does keep you going? What, uh, yeah. what, uh, um, what, what do you see as, as being hopeful for, for, for us for the future, but, yeah. um, to focus a little bit about, um, uh, our issue this month, which is environmental conservation in particular, how women are disproportionately impacted by em environmental degradation and climate change. Can you tell us how you see women impacted by climate change, um, and environmental degradation in the area where you guys work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the situation when it comes to climate change, I mean, we know in general that the global South is being much more impacted um, than we are per se. Um, and they have actually contributed the least to climate change. So the places that really haven't caused this problem are now being greatly affected by it. And in particular, women and girls are affected. And that is because a large part of their role in their communities is around food. It's about agriculture. It's about actually gathering and collecting water. And so these are things that are directly affected by climate change. So when we have extreme weather, whether it be droughts or whether it be in the case of Rwanda, we've actually been struggling with really heavy rains that are causing landslides and lots of erosion. Um, that affects food production, which is the responsibility of women. Um, again, when you have droughts or you have long periods of time where water is scarce, it takes that much longer for women and often for girls, that's their responsibility to go and gather water. And so they'll be pulled out of school to do this really important job for their family. So we're working in a part of the world that already is being um, disproportionately affected. And then women and, and, and children and girls on top of that are being disproportionately affected by climate change. And I noticed that some of your programs involve um, helping the women with, with, uh, with growing alternative sources of, of food that they can mm -hmm. use to feed their own families, but then also to sell and, and make money for their families as well. Um, and so uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting part of, of what you do. Again, helping people to then save gorillas, because if they're less reliant on, on the, the forest itself, they can um, uh, and they can they can help their own families that way. Right. So, yeah. Um, and I saw mushroom growing, beekeeping. What are some of the, the other projects you guys have going that are specific um along those lines. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned earlier, Vicki, just to go back before I talk about that and don't let me forget to answer your question, but um, you know, we work on these four strategic pillars that you guys heard about in the video. So the first two are really our legacy from Diane Fossey. It is that 24 seven on the ground, out in the field, protecting gorillas. And then it's the science piece, you know, the orig original reason Diane went there. So it's, it's conducting science, not just on the gorillas, but on these ecosystems as a whole because ultimately to do good conservation, you have to have good scientific data. 
But then over the last two and a half decades, we really expanded into what we call the human dimensions of conservation. Um, and so a lot of that is about training the next, well, the conservationists of today and tomorrow with a real focus on African conservationists because they are highly underrepresented in the, the study and conservation of their own wildlife. We did a, a paper a few years ago where we showed that about 6% of studies in top tier journals, so journals that American, you know, um, that academics would want to publish in, six percent of the studies that were done on African wildlife were actually led by Africans. So it's still a very extractive industry where people like myself, you know, go in, we collect our data, we come back to our university, we publish, and we go on to establish our career. So we really want to build that generation of African conservationists and scientists. And then the last dimension, as you mentioned, is really around helping communities. And it's focusing on the root cause that they need to go into the forest. So it's livelihood development, it's food security, and a lot of it is just education, either providing educational opportunities for their children, but also doing conservation education in communities so people understand the value. I can't tell you how many times community members have asked me, well, I don't understand. Why are you coming to Rwanda to study gorillas? Why don't you just study gorillas back in America? So they don't really necessarily know that the gorillas are their biological heritage, that we don't have them in Europe or in America, that this is unique to their backyards. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I say that, you know, a lot of us got into this field because we cared about wildlife, we cared about animals, we were into conservation. But ultimately, conservationists are doing so much more. I mean, you may have heard of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 of them. One of them is life on land, which is biodiversity conservation. But when I look at our programs, we're actually touching on nine of those 17 sustainability um, development goals, whether it be no poverty, whether it be you know um, gender equity, whether it be food security, um, job creation. So we are tasked with a much bigger job than what we originally maybe went in there for. And that's just the, the face of conservation these days, unfortunately. But yeah, our, our, we have mushroom growing programs that are wonderful because they provide an incredible source of protein for communities, um, but they also provide livelihoods. And um, some of the stats, so we go in and we teach people, you know, A, how to grow the mushrooms. B, we also teach them how to cook mushrooms because if it's not part of their diet, it might be not, not something they're familiar with how to prepare for themselves. And then we also teach them how to do like village savings and loans. So how do you invest that money so that eventually we're not providing 100% support? You know, so in year one, we provide 100%. By year three, we're only providing 75%. And then eventually weaning them off of any investment from us. And they're using the proceeds of these programs to invest back and keep them going. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it uh we've we've seen those kind of programs in other other areas. Mm -hmm. It's safe to hear about that. But specifically our our um grant for, for you guys is funding um the the girls in conservation project. So could you talk um specifically about that? What's the vision for the project and what do you hope to achieve? I understand it just started in 2023. So it's relatively new. What are what are the goals? Yeah. So gender equity is an is a important issue for the organization as a whole, whether it be for our staff um, and whether in the communities that we work in. And we do a lot of education in local schools. Um, we're in about 25 schools around the park in Rwanda, reaching about 10,000 school kids a year. Um, and one of the things is that we noticed is that a lot of these young women who are in primary school they don't actually go on to secondary school. You heard Nadia mention that about 9% of the girls in the, in the area of Rwanda where we work actually graduate from secondary school. And we know that you know conservation is gonna work best in the future. A, if we have a very diverse group of people that are working in conservation, not just men, um, but women as well. But also there's the saying that you know you educate a boy, you educate an individual, you educate a girl, you educate a village. And there's lots of evidence showing that women, when they have higher educational attainment levels, there are positive benefits for outcome, I'm sorry, positive outcomes for conservation. So not only are you improving the life of that individual and their family and hopefully their community, but ultimately it will have a positive impact on the on conservation as well, which is you know, our ultimate mission. So we started this program and, and really Nadia, who you saw spearheaded this program, incredibly proud of her and she's very passionate about it. She is someone that um, 
you know, started with us as a university student, came and worked with us, and we provided her with training opportunities. She then um, did her senior thesis with us, was then hired as a professional intern, hired as a research assistant. She was out with the gorillas for seven years collecting data under those really challenging conditions that you mentioned. And now she's leading and helping to lead this program. And the idea is to, um, a, give girls mentors to provide them with mentorship opportunities. So Nadia goes out and kind of scours the community to find women that are working and that can act as mentors for these young girls. One of her favorite expressions, expressions is you cannot be what you cannot see. So um, some of the women are working in conservation. Some of them are working in the hospitality industry because there's lots of lovely hotels, you know, that are, are catering to tourists. Some of them are working for the park authorities. So pairing these girls up with individual mentors that they can spend some time with, educating teachers and bringing um, curriculum around conservation, around women empowerment that these teachers can then take back into the classroom to teach to their students, both male and female. Um, and then bringing girls to our, our new beautiful Ellen DeGeneres campus where they get to have an immersive several day experience. They stay on campus, they get lectures from our team, they have projects that they have to do. They then present those projects, but really empowering them, um, enabling them to see the kind of career possibilities that lie ahead. And then a subset of them are, are given scholarships to attend public boarding schools because we know that the outcomes for those schools for girls to graduate are much higher than in the local um, the local public schools. So that's kind of the program in a nutshell. Every year, the hope is that we're gonna be able to take about 20 girls and provide them with these educational opportunities. Um, and they're provided with scholarships for three years. So we take them kind of halfway through secondary school to get them through those last three years. And they have sort of conservation projects that they're expected to do either at their school or in their community as, as part of receiving the scholarship. And I think it's been amazing to hear from their parents um, how proud they are that their girls have been given these opportunities and how grateful they are. Um, I'll never forget some of our colleagues in Congo say that the single most important thing they think that the Fosse Fund has done is enabled them to enable their children to continue um, having an education. Um, education is so, so important in these communities where we work and it's a really valued opportunity. And, and so we're thrilled to be able to be contributing in yet another way through the Girls in Conservation Program. Well, that's terrific. And we look forward to getting updates um, as the program goes forward and to hear how it is going and, and lessons learned. Um, just a, a quick note for, people that might not be familiar with the term secondary school mm -hmm. it's kind of the equivalent of high school for for those of us here in the United States um and and uh there is a from the the reading I've been doing there's there's been a big push towards education um and towards uh gender equality and and education for girls in Rwanda but the idea that only nine percent complete mm -hmm. secondary school um, uh, or high school in that particular area around right. the park is really um, heartbreaking. Is there right. anything in particular? I mean, it's the poverty, it sounds like. Um, I'm sure COVID didn't help, but are there particular obstacles that the girls in, in that area face? I think it's a it's a great question, Vicki, and I think it's a combination of things. I think it is the poverty that you mentioned. I think it is the lack of kind of um, realizing what opportunities there might be beyond secondary school, because there might not be a lot of those examples out there. It is the reliance of these communities. It is a, they are completely reliant for the most part on subsistence agriculture for their income. And so they need women and girls to be working in the fields, to be gathering water. And so this, this convergence of all of these things just means that that while primary school is free in Rwanda, there are fees in secondary school. And some of the times those just become an impediment for larger families and, and families will end up having to make priorities. And they will oftentimes prioritize their male children over their female children because they're viewed as having more opportunities in the long run and after graduation. Um, and it, but you yeah. bring up a really good point that I do want to mention and that Rwanda, I think, is very progressive. And thinking about gender equality, um, they have the most women in parliament of any country in the world. And in fact, they broke their own record recently. They they held the record and then they broke that by having, I don't know what the percentage is now, but 
it's upward of 60 or 70% of the women in parliament, uh, of the individuals in parliament are women. So there is a real push there. It just takes time. And we're working in, in rural communities. And you see a lot of this first happening in the cities. And it just takes a longer time to get out to these rural communities. I think sometimes we forget, too, that it, it was only, you know, 1994 that they suffered the horrible genocide. So the progress that has been made in a relatively short period of time is actually quite impressive. Um, and same with the guerrillas. I mean, that's, um, you know, talking about Diane Fossey's legacy, I, I read that at one point when she first was studying the, the guerrillas, they were down to the 200s. There were 250 some guerrillas the, of the mountain guerrillas left. And and I've heard you say now it's up in the like a thousand. Mm -hmm. uh, so how are the gorillas doing? But also what I've also seen concerns about the habitat because mm -hmm. there's more gorillas, but there there isn't more habitat. But I think there's a push to to expand some of the land. Is there? How's that going? Nikki, I have to tell you, you know so much. <laughs> you are very, uh, you're very well versed on these topics, and you're you're hitting on a lot of things. Um, so yeah, just to start off with your question about how gorillas are doing, I want to just take a quick step back and do a, a little gorilla 101 for folks, because um, there's actually four types of gorillas in Africa. Um, so and it, how gorillas are doing depends on which type you're talking about. So I'm going to start in West Africa. There's a type there called the Cross River Gorilla. Most people have never heard of them. There are 300 of them left on the planet. They live on the on the um, border of Nigeria and Cameroon, um, and so they are the most they're the most endangered um, subspecies of ape actually on the planet. If you move a little bit over to like uh, places like uh, Equatorial Guinea and the Republic of Congo, the smaller Congo, there we hit Western lowland gorillas. And those of the four types of gorillas are the only ones that you'll find in zoos. So you won't find mountain gorillas in zoos, you won't find cross rivers. So Western lowland, they are by far the healthiest of the gorilla populations. We estimate that there's probably about 300,000 of them left, which is wonderful. The challenge is they're declining and they're declining rapidly because of poaching. They're, they're directly poached for, they're po directly poached for food from habitat loss, and also from diseases like Ebola. When you hear about an Ebola outbreak in humans, many times it may have come because someone found a dead gorilla in the forest and they brought it into their village and ate it and that's how Ebola was transmitted. Um, and Ebola is just as deadly in gorillas, unfortunately, as it is in humans. Um, and then if you move over to Central Africa, you have the Growers Gorilla. Most people haven't heard of them. They are only found in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. It's the other type of gorilla that we work with. They are not doing well either. There's about 6,000 of them left. But as I mentioned earlier, we've lost 60% of them in 20 years alone. And that is really a direct result of hunting for food um, in these very poor communities. And then the last, the easternmost type is the mountain gorilla. So the one we've kind of been talking about where Diane Fossey started. They, as I mentioned, are increasing in number. And you're exactly right. When Diane was there, that population was down to about 250 individuals. She thought they would be extinct by the year 2000. Instead, the tide has changed and they're increasing. That population is now at about 600. And then there's another small population in Uganda of 400. So that's how we get to 1,000. But the ones that Diane worked with have gone from about 250 to 600. So it's great, but it's taken more than 30 years for that to happen because gorillas reproduce really slowly. Um, and again, with only a thousand total, it's a really small number. One pandemic like COVID, one natural disaster could really wipe out the population. Um, and one of the challenges we're seeing from this success that you alluded to is that while the numbers of gorillas are increasing, mountain gorillas, their, their habitat isn't. And one of their biggest challenges is they have very, very small habitat. So between the two, it's only about 800 square kilometers, which I'm trying to think what that translates to in miles, but you know, probably 400 square miles, really tiny habitat, tops of these volcanoes surrounded by, you know, a very high human population density. So as a pop, they don't, meaning they can't spread out really. So as the population has increased, we're starting to see the growth rate really slow down because these gorilla families are bumping into each other a lot more. And when they bump into each other, animals can get injured and even killed. So the Rwandan government is undertaking a pretty um, progressive uh, undertaking, which is to hopefully expand the park and reclaim some of the land that was just lost 
like in the 1970s, it was cut down and just make the park a little bit bigger so that the gorillas have a bit more space. Which is wonderful. That's great news. Do you think it's um, partly because of the realization that the tourism is actually helping the, the, the economy? There's how many people come to see the gorillas every year? There's a lot. Yeah. So a lot of people don't realize tourism to see mountain gorillas in Rwanda is I don't know, I can't say it's exactly number one, but it's usually number one or number two source of foreign revenue for the entire country. Rwanda is a tiny little landlocked country. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources. Its most wonderful resource are its people um, and then also its wildlife. And so, yes, very much, you know, Rwanda has been able to rebuild after the genocide, which the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the genocide is, is this Sunday, um, or, or the start of the genocide, I should say. Um, but um, so it's a critical, critical part of the economy. And so, yes, if you increase the park and there are more gorillas, there are more opportunities for tourism as well. Um, but it's very well managed tourism. So uh, you asked how many people can go and really they only let, there's only 12 families of gorillas right now out of the 24 that live in the park that are visited by tourists. They're only visited once per day. Each family is only visited once per day for a maximum of one hour by a maximum of eight people. So if you do the math, which I can't do off the top of my head, but roughly that means that if they had 100% saturation, they could accommodate about 25,000 tourists a year. So it is still very, very small, but it is a critical, critical piece of the economy for sure. Great, um, it's definitely on my list, on my, on my bucket list to get there. Um, for, for I know there's some questions coming in on the chat. We're gonna get to questions um, shortly. So if you do have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, your story about, uh, you talked a little bit about Nadia. Um, and I, I noticed that of your 400 some people that are, that are working in, um, in, uh, Rwanda that, or, uh, and the, the Eastern mm -hmm. Dem Democratic Republic of the Congo that of the 400, all but four are, are African or Rwandan or, or Congolese, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, which is great. So can you share a personal story of a woman or a girl who has been impacted by the, the work of the, the Fosse, um, the Fosse Fund? Yeah, um, thank you for that. Yeah, we're very, very proud that we are an African-run and led organization on the ground. And I, there there are so many, um, you know, I, what I really love seeing right now within our organization is the number of young female scientists that are joining us. So I think right now about 45% of our scientists are um, women. So they are out there in the field doing this incredible work, you know, that, that Diane Fossey kind of set the stage for and now they're continuing and in the past year, we've had one go to Germany to get her master's, one go on a full scholarship to the UK to do her master's. We just had one of our female research assistants get accepted to come do her PhD at the at George Washington University, a full, full, full coverage to come to George Washington University to do her PhD. And so I love seeing these women that when they were in university, you know, thought, I can't, I don't know if I can do this. Maybe my family isn't going to support me to do this. And now they're going on and doing these amazing advanced degrees and coming back to their country and sharing this knowledge and going full circle. You know, they started with us as the students and now they're coming back and they are the teachers, which I absolutely love. Um, and then in our community work, there's one woman in particular, and we, we do have a video about her on our YouTube page if you want to go look it out. Her name look at it. Her name is Severine. And she is part of the Mushroom Cooperative. And she talks about how she used to sort of be embarrassed in her community because she was dependent on the forest and she knew it was wrong to go into the forest and to poach and to collect firewood, but she didn't really have any options. And being part of the Fosse Fund's work and leading the Mushroom Cooperative in her community has given her such a sense of purpose and so much pride. And now she's really become a spokesperson in her community, telling people why the forest is important and that we don't need to be using the forest and that there are all these other options there. And um, I think for these women that, that lead a pretty tough life in a lot of ways, they're out working in the fields you know, uh, for long days to see the pride that she has in the work that she's done um, and knowing that she's transmitting that 
to others in her community and to her family as well is, is, is very, very heartwarming. And I feel so honored to have played such a, a small role in, in, in helping that happen. Severine is a force. I watched that video and, and she's yeah. really something. Your website is awesome. So um, those of, of the people tuning in today, if you haven't gone there yet, please go to the um, the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund website. Um, really terrific information. And then our website, Together Women Rise, has a ton of information as well um, about Rwanda, um, about uh, the Gorilla Fund, about the project that we're working on. Um, lots of information there for our chapter leaders and for others that are interested in learning more. So um, thank you. Uh, we are gonna, I'm gonna switch this over to, to Wendy to, um, to give us some of the questions from the audience and then we'll do a final wrap up. Um, so Wendy, would you like to ask some of the questions? Sure, I've been keeping track here, there's quite a few. Uh, so our first question is from someone who has worked with, um, I'm not going to say this name right, but I'll try, Dr. Gladys Kenhima Sikusoka. Okay, you're, you're nodding your head. Um, yeah. He works in Uganda and works with local communities to prevent disease from spreading from humans to gorillas. Is there a similar program in Rwanda or Congo um, to prevent the disease diseases from spreading to gorillas? Yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, Gladys is, she's a force of nature. Um, and I've been, been very honored to work alongside her for a number of years. Um, so yes, yeah, so, I mean, obviously when we're in communities, we're also educating them about disease risk and disease transfer. Um, we used to do a lot of work actually in the health sector, um, helping to rebuild health clinics, um, to do training and triage in health clinics. Um, we also have another, there's another nonprofit called Gorilla Doctors, which is more on the veterinary side. And so they work with communities around potentially treating their animals so that we don't have disease crossover from cows or other animals that might be defecating in fields and then the gorillas come out. Um, so I think everyone that's working with communities is definitely taking a role just to provide that, that educational opportunity to explain to people the risk both from gorillas getting diseases from us, but also it can go the other way too. So you mentioned that, um, I think you said about 400 or of the uh, mountain gorillas um, in existence today are in Uganda. And someone's wondering why the Fossey Fund um, is not working in Uganda and just works in Rwanda and the uh, DRC. That's a great question that we get. We get asked a lot, excuse me. So, you know, we had this long history of being in Rwanda. And then in around 2000, the organization was stable and had grown enough. And the situation in Rwanda had, had um, stabilized a bit um, in the aftermath of the genocide that we were able to step back and say, okay, we want to expand. Where is the next con conservation frontier for gorillas? And where do they need us the most? And Uganda, luckily, the gorillas, like in Rwanda, are well protected. They live in a national park. The Rwandan Wildlife Authority is there protecting them. And so we felt like our presence there, while I'm sure there could have been things we would have done, that there were already great folks working on the ground. But when we looked to Eastern Congo, we could see that there the challenges, there were really significant challenges ahead and the population was not doing well. I mean, so that's why we decided to make that move into an area where we felt that the gorillas and the communities really could benefit from our model that we, you know, that we have been developing in Rwanda for a long time. And someone was wondering if you could just describe in, uh, a little bit more about where, what the region is called, where you are working in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we work in kind of the Musanzi district. So Kigali is the capital. It's fairly centrally located. And we're about a two and a half to three hour drive to the northwest of Kigali. So it's up in the corner of Ro Rwanda. And actually the habitat where the gorillas live, it straddles three countries. So I mentioned they live basically on the top of six volcanoes. Um, the forest has been cut, you know, up to eight or 9,000, I mean, not nine, but, you know, seven and a half or 8,000 feet. So it's this little island of forest surrounded by, you know, farmlands. And those forests occur in Rwanda, in Congo, and in Uganda. So um, it's the sort of where all three countries meet. So you don't, you can walk 
30 minutes in the forest and actually be on the Congolese side in some places. Um, so that's the part of the country where we work. It's up in the northwest corner of, of Rwanda. Right. And then when you go to Congo, you actually, if you go to Goma, which is right on the on the Rwandan border, you have to take a 45 minute helicopter um, west and then drive for about another four hours to get to the community where we work. And there it's on the very edge of the Congo Basin. And if, for those of you that may not be familiar, the Congo Basin is the second largest remaining tropical rainforest on our planet after the Amazon. Um, it is the lungs of the planet and it is one of our best natural defenses against climate change. And so these forests are critical, not just for the gorillas, not just for the people that live in the region, but ultimately for the survival of our own species. And so it's one of the reasons why, you know, people often say to me, Tara, you know, sounds like you have a cool job. Gorillas sound really neat, but we have so many things, so many challenges facing us on the planet. Like why gorillas? And because it's about so much more than gorillas. And I really think ultimately, you know, the two, two of the largest existential crises facing our own species are climate change and biodiversity loss. And biodiversity loss, because as we're losing pollinators, as we're losing this kind of intricate web of life, at some point, these ecosystems are going to collapse, and we're already seeing it in some places. And we're addressing both of those things through our work, um, and particularly in Congo, where we're protecting a huge area of forest. It's 2,400 square kilometers, about 1,000 square miles of this beautiful tropical rainforest. Um, so that's kind of where we are. But I think, again, to just to, it's, a, it's about a lot more than gorillas. It's ultimately about ourselves as well. Well, and someone would like you to talk a little bit more about the connections between feminism and sustainability and conservation, because those also go hand in hand. And you touched on it briefly, but if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Well, I mean, I think, you know, just on the one side of things, it, you know, the the more education that women have and the longer that they're able to stay in school, generally the smaller family sizes they have. So that's one big element. So you're just, you're having far, fewer uh, fewer children um, and those children oftentimes are able to get better health care, et cetera. So the outcomes for those children are better. So that helps with, you know, population growth on the planet. Um, it also enables women to maybe have more opportunities out of the house because they're not constantly going, you know, through childbirth birth and child rearing. But also women are decision makers for their families and what their families eat. And so if they're educated about why poaching is a challenge and why taking animals out of the forest is a challenge or why gathering fuel and firewood in the forest is a problem, it's degrading these natural areas, having them educated about all of these elements then ultimately can have positive outcomes for conservation as well. So I think even if they weren't necessarily learning about conservation and be giving, being given alternatives, just the idea that the more education women have, the, the smaller their family sizes, that can have a huge impact on conservation too. And again, on the lives of these women. Absolutely. Um, do you... Are you doing any direct mitigating strategy strategies in terms of helping with water conservation or conservation of firewood? Great question. We have as an organization traditionally done a good bit on water conservation. So we have built um, big um, water tanks for communities and helped bring water into communities. In Rwanda, that really has become kind of a, a um, it has been really moved under a government infrastructure. And so we kind of stepped out of that field. But in our last strategic planning meeting that we just had and to, to set our new strategic plan, one of our goals is to really reevaluate what our potential role might be in water because it is a huge problem. Um, even though it rains in Rwanda nine months out of the year, when the dry season comes around, we see very quickly people run out of water. And I remember now this has been a couple of years ago now, probably close to a decade, but one of the studies we did, we literally sat outside of the forest and in a two month period, we counted 6,000 people going into that very tiny forest just to gather water. So when you think about the potential impact on the forest, but also the impact on these people's lives that they're spending an enormous amount of time to get to the edge of the forest, going into the forest and coming out. And so um, in the last few, I think the last big water infrastructure project we did was probably during COVID or right before, but we're again starting to think about, and it's gonna be conversations that we have with the government and with community leaders about, is there a continued role for us to play in water? Because it does have such an impact on the forest and people as well. Right. 
Um, there's, there are a couple more questions, but I think we've run out of time. We've covered quite a few of them. I'll turn it back to you, Vicki. Okay, thanks, Wendy. Um, wow, um, I did wanna give you an opportunity. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to say one more thing about or, or tell us one more thing or, and, uh, and if not, I do have one final question for you. It, and that is um, what makes you hopeful? Mm. Uh, it is a great question. Uh, the only thing I would have loved to have done is told you like one or two of my favorite gorilla stories because they are so amazing, but you'll have to come back for that. Or actually I, um, I did a TEDx talk last year where I talk about how amazing gorilla families are. So if you have the opportunity to walk, watch that and you'll get a little bit of a sense of, of, you know, how much like us they are, I say they share 98% of our DNA and they share our common humanity. They take care of their most vulnerable. They form lifelong friendships. They mourn the loss of a family member. So they're just amazing, amazing animals that deserve a place on our planet. Um, but what gives me hope? Um, I think the people I get to work alongside give me hope. Um, I mean, Rwanda is an incredibly hopeful place. And to see what that country has accomplished in the last 30 years since the horrific genocide. Uh, you can't go there and not feel hopeful. It is a, a country that is, I say it's not walking, but it's running to its future and it has a plan and it's a real privilege to get to work for. I talked about how the people of Congo bring me hope. Um, and I, I guess I'm an optimist at heart, um, but I think what mountain gorillas tell us is that conservation can work. And, and I mean, think about the conditions under which it's worked here. The situation that is engulfed these countries, Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo in the last 50 years, the challenges that these countries have faced. This is a place where mountain gorillas could have easily slipped off the planet, but because one woman initially cared and she created a community of people that cared and that have stayed, conservation has worked and that gives me hope, but we need resources. We need commitment. Conservation is not an in and out. You need to be there for the long haul. You need to convince these communities that you are there alongside them, that you're not just gonna come in and go away. So we have to commit in the long term to conservation, but it can work. And, and that gives me, gives me a lot of hope. Well, that's a great note um, to finish on. We can't thank you enough for being with us tonight. Um, and Together Women Rise is very proud to support the work of the Diane Fossey um, Gorilla Fund and uh, the Girls in Conservation Project in particular. So thank you very, very much for your time tonight. Um, before I let everybody else go, um, I do want to thank you all for being with us this evening. Um, do look up uh, uh, Tara's uh, TEDx talk. It's it's very touching. It's a it's a, a wonderful. Just Google her name and you'll you'll find it as, <laughs> as TEDx talk. Um, and uh, uh, we also welcome everybody uh, in attendance tonight to more of our upcoming events. So continuing with our Earth uh, celebration, our Earth Month celebration, you're invited to join our book club on Thursday, April 16th at 8 p.m. Eastern time, um, where we will discuss Guardians of the Trees by Dr. Kanari Webb, who is also a founder of one of our former grantees, Health in Harmony. Um, and you're welcome to join that discussion, even if you haven't read the book. Um, so Dr. Canari will be with us that night and kind of similar, same, same, but different. Um, she started out studying orangutans oh, in wow. Korea, and then um, listened to the local people and why they were cutting down the trees and helped start this, um, this organization that, um, that does great things in Indonesia. Uh, then our next monthly webinar will be on Thursday, May 2nd, also at 8 p.m. Eastern time, featuring two of our grantees, uh, the Fistula Foundation and One Heart Worldwide. And then don't forget about our 2024, um, our 2024 trips. Tomorrow, our Guatemala travelers leave us. Adios. Have a buen viaje. Um, there are still spots for our Malawi trip in October and our Cambodia trip in November. And you can find more details on our website under the Join Us tab under Travel. So all of this is on our website at togetherwomenrise.org um, and you can see all the, all the details. Lastly, 
Thank you to our generous members whose contributions allow us to partner with incredible organizations like the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund as we strive toward uh, global gender equality. A recurring donation or an increase in the amount that you give each month can make a meaningful difference in the lives of women and girls in low-income communities in the Global South. If you're willing to donate, please visit our website again, togetherwomenrise.org slash give. By harnessing the collective power of our members, together we can create a world where every woman and girl has a chance to thrive. So thank you for joining us tonight. We hope to see you at a future event. And thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much, Vicki. Thank you for having me. And again, thank you guys so much for your support and happy soon to be Earth Day. Yeah, yeah. Um, very positive note with your uh, mm -hmm. uh, with, with what you told us tonight. So appreciate it very, very much.